Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. And today we're in Kirkland, Washington, here at a conference that's discussing the, the future of outpatient total hip replacement and total knee replacement. And today we'll be talking with Ira Kirschenbaum, who probably has a little bit different, different spin on the notion of, of what it takes to do a outpatient total joint uh, procedure and have a successful outcome. So Ira, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me today. Dr. Kirschenbaum, would you please tell the audience a little about your background in terms of where you practice now and your experience over the last 20 to 30 years in orthopedics? Sure. Currently, I'm the chairman of orthopedics at Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center. It's one of the largest urban hospital centers in the country. We have almost 1,000 beds, over 1 million clinic visits. It's the poorest congressional district in the country. Uh, we take care of about 430,000 unique patients, and it's a very busy urban place. Prior to that, I was in a private practice in the New York metropolitan area, which is a little more boutique, and prior to that, I worked for five years for Kaiser Permanente as head of reconstructive and joint surgery in the Northeast. So I've had the managed care, the private practice, and a large urban academic center experience. Well, and today, in, in the first half of our conference today, we've heard uh, a lot of perspectives in terms of doing outpatient total joint replacement uh, in some of those boutique practices so, to some degree. So we're really hearing from people who um, have a fairly upscale population that is very motivated and generally speaking control some aspect of their own uh, ambulatory surgery center so that they can be in control of the process from front to back and are dealing with very motivated patients that in some cases have fairly significant comorbidities but also have excellent medical care. I think in, in, in the Bronx, in your environment, um, that probably is a little more challenging in terms of, of trying to control all aspects of the total joint replacement uh, continuum, so to speak, from beginning to end. So enlighten us a bit about some of those challenges. Well, the challenges that we face are probably similar to the boutique practitioners, but they haven't seen it yet because they're just starting off as early adopters. I think it's easy to control processes that are already pre-controlled before you get there. If you're a teacher and you take over a student class of all A students that are all well-behaved and they're on, not on Ritalin, I think that's an easy experience for you. But when you go into a both a financially and culturally and educationally diverse environment, which could be in many locations, you're going to be dealing with a lot of challenges because physicians aren't necessarily used to controlling the entire continuum of care. They control the metal in the operating room. We often control what procedure, what technique we use, and we control when we say you're going home. But how many actually control the preoperative experience or the post-discharge experience or really know what home care is doing with their patients on a real-time basis? And one of the things I talk about a lot is as you control more and more of the processes, you need more levers of control within your daily behavior. And it's very important, those levers of control oftentimes may overrun your current management and internal operations. So you may have to begin to look at how you're going to train your management of your practice and have a different outlook about your involvement in this process. Well, it's very interesting because we've talked to several patients uh, this morning and almost to a person, those patients really sort of pointed out two critical pieces to their success. One was a very well done preoperative preparation. And I'm talking about education so that they knew what to expect and they were prepared to shoulder some of that burden. And the second piece was having adequate care at home, 24 hours a day for the, for the first seven or eight days in order to be able to get through the early stages of recovery from a total joint. So even though they may be going home on the same day, um, they're requiring around the, around the clock nursing care by a family member for that first seven days. So I think what you're pointing out is, is, is extremely important um, to assess 
those, those families and assess the, the support system that some of these patients have in the urban setting, are they really going to be able to uh, find that support and are they really going to be able to partake in a preoperative preparation that they can understand, that they can assimilate and be able to shoulder some of that burden. So I, I think that's what I hear you saying at this yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, there, there's two parts that, that I'm alluding to. One is there is a diversity of education in an urban environment, forgetting about cultures and language. There are just some people who did not, new immigrants, new people in our area, we have new immigrants from West Africa, we have immigrants from the Caribbean, and English is not the primary language, but separate from that, they might not have as much education in general, versus somebody who almost always in certain these practices at least finished high school and some college. Then you're getting a diversity of understanding disease and understanding and getting on the internet. We have, we think we have less than 10% of our patients on the internet. So that alone, we're not having built-in education. So there's culture, then there's a language. 65% of our patients are Spanish speaking as a primary language. So are you educating them completely or just through an interpreter, which is at best partial than you knowing the language? So those are those issues. The second issue, which is something I always like to talk about, is the idea of process management. You know, there are three processes in managing anything. There's what's called the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream. And in the classic example is oil exploration. Oil exploration has an upstream where you explore oil. Then you have the midstream, which is the refinery. And then you have the downstream, which are the tankers leaving it to the gas stations. Well, in this idea of ambulatory joint replacement setting, the refinery is your ASC. Your pre-op is actually now part of that refinery because it's part of a whole preparation. You know, it's certainly great if you can tell a lot of patients who want to go home early, you're getting more patients, more great, it's more oil you're bringing in. But if you can't process it properly, you're gonna choke up your refinery. What do I mean? The downstream, if you start getting a lot of phone calls, or if you start getting a certain number of readmissions, or if you get, start getting a number of people who are a little confused about whether to use a reacher or a raised toilet seat, that's gonna choke up your resources and back up your refinery. So it truly is a continuum from understanding the patient comes to you you have to prepare them very well and you send them out. Which is why I feel that just the focus of thinking about ambulatory joint replacement is exciting because people who have, let's say, longer length of stays in hospitals, some of the techniques that we've been talking about at this conference to improve the, the chance of doing ambulatory joint replacements are actually gonna have great positive patient-centric benefit for the inpatient setting because we're talking about decreasing pain, decreasing incision size, increasing mobilization. But understanding the whole process, and I, and I am more fearful of the discharge and how many people actually monitor the home care experience. And as we expand this to more patients, we're gonna need some monitoring tools related to that home care experience, whether it's family home care or formal home care services. People want to, want to know what's happening. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think that the trend in healthcare across the board these days is to move towards more and more ambulatory care and drive care of the patient throughout the whole continuum into the ambulatory setting and out of the acute hospital. So we're seeing that in the uh, establishment of medical homes. We're seeing that in terms of, of trying to manage more and more complex problems outside the hospital. Now, I think we've got a couple of ways to, to do that because it's not historically in the orthopedist purview to sort of think about primary care for patients. You know, they take patients from primary care, do what they need to do, hand them back to primary care, and primary care takes it from, from there. What you're, you're describing and what we're seeing at this conference in terms of the suburban setting in the affluent population is that the orthopedic practice is beginning to assume more of that 
of that interaction with the patient, but they're also dealing with a patient population that shoulders a lot of that burden. How do you see moving in the urban setting to meeting that continuum? Is this something that the orthopedic department or the orthopedic practice is going to take on responsibility for? Or do you see this as driving orthopedists to create relationships with primary care physicians that are much tighter in terms of team-based care? Which direction do you see this going? I think it's going to be the latter, I, but I think the orthopedic surgeons are going to need to be the leaders. They may not be the managers, but they will need to lead the team. I think that we started a program at our hospital where we hired an internist as an orthopedic hospitalist that sees all our patients before the surgery and the same internist follows them in the surgery. Sort of a periop hospitalist. Not an incredibly novel concept, but we really hired it in the orthopedic department. I think that people do a lot of talking about teams and relationships, but I think they have to be dedicated teams and relationships in urban settings. You can't sit there and send an education packet to the patient's primary care doctor. I think the orthopedic surgeon is going to have to set up a, a squad of four or five internists that will function from just before pre-op to the 30 days post-op that are going to manage the medical problems. And that's going to need a lot of leadership. All right? The medical team will manage it, but there's no way you'll be able to build just relationships where you call them up, and I know him well because we've golfed together. These, these relations, you need, just like you need a team in the OR that's dedicated to get quality joint replacement, the same scrub nurses, you're going to need, I really think it's going to turn into what we fooled around talking about, an idea of not just a medical home, but an orthopedic home, or an old line of an old website we do about called Bone Home. There will need to be a concept that the post-surgical home, like the concept of the government talked about of medical homes, is going to be a definable product, which I think is going to include uh, dedicated nurse practitioners, dedicated nurses, dedicated home care to the peri-op setting. And that's where you're going to get efficiency, you're going to get patient satisfaction, decreased length of stay in the hospital, of course, decreased length of stay, sorry, decreased length of utilization of post-operative services, you're going to see. And I'm a big fan of it going in that direction. And that's what we're building in the South Bronx, dedicated groups of post-operative medical homes. That's our next phase, and we just started that this year as a new initiative. You know, I think that your insight about focus, where during the perioperative period, a, an internist that has the same focus as the orthopedic surgeon, understanding that the patient's primary problem now is an orthopedic problem, and the medical problems are all surrounding that orthopedic problem, but the primary focus has to be the orthopedic problem. Now, that may not be true 30 days later. It may be the heart disease or whatever. And I think that the other piece that we've seen is that over the last few years, there's been an incredible focus on transitions of care. And what we're really talking about is going from that perioperative focus in this population, transitioning back to a focus where maybe it is their chronic diseases and, and the total joint is, is, is no longer an issue. It's a resolved problem. How do you anticipate dealing with that transition of care? Because that perioperative internist eventually is going to have to very deftly turn that care back over in a smooth way that does not disrupt the whole continuum of care to the primary care provider that, right. that is going to take care of that patient until they need another orthopedic procedure. Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, the perioperative uh, internist and also the orthopedic surgeon never remove the primary care physician from this dedicated team. And that's, that's an important thing. They have to, even though we'll be doing the pre-op evaluation, we'll be owning the patient for 30 days. The, starting on the first day, there needs to be a reporting mechanism that's back to the primary care doctor what's happening. One of the challenges, which you didn't talk about, is that many patients don't have primary care doctors in urban settings. They may have signed up to a health plan. They were assigned a primary care doctor. But our challenge oftentimes is a joke that I sometimes says that I'm in the business of indicating surgery that'll never get done, but I save people's lives. Because they come to me 
and in a pre-op workup with the first medical doctor they've ever seen. And then we discover diabetes and other diseases, and we have to find them internists. And I think that focus has to be on an allied health group within the orthopedic home, like a nurse practitioner and a PA or some group of that nature, or social worker, who will really focus full-time on that transition of care for a third of the patients who have no primary care doctors. And also, we've discovered new diseases sometimes in the workup. So we've changed the terrain of the patient by discovering new diseases. We've also changed the climate by putting a big stress on them of surgery. And then they're gonna go back to a new terrain to their own primary care doctor. And that's why I think it has to be a full-time transition team. It has to be a full-time. You cannot just write a few memos in complex environments. It's very different. In most suburban settings and, and most more affluent settings, you, you really do have people who are the internist and primary care doctor truly knows the patient a long time. But you know, in urban settings, we also have all the other hospital-based problems. We have physician turnover in big academic centers where clinic doctors often come and go. So you're not getting that 20-year continuity of care. And that's why that, that team has to be very sharp in the transition to care. And, and I hope that we as orthopedic surgeons understand we have to take a leadership role in ushering our patient from three months before surgery to three to six months afterwards. Well, it's interesting. One of the most fascinating things I hear you saying is that you're seeing a shift. You're, you're actually driving a shift in the Bronx towards the traditional way that the orthopedic surgeon saw himself as just simply a, a craftsman that had a specific job to do. And that was never seen in the context of the patient's overall health status. I mean, it was either, is he healthy enough to operate on or not? And no decisions were necessarily made beyond that within the whole context of the patient's disease process. What I hear you saying is that you're suggesting that orthopedic surgeons need to take on the role of understanding that they have a critical role in the continuum of care for this patient within the context of his overall medical condition. And what you've been able to do at the Bronx is, is actually maybe do something more important than simply replacing a, a, an ailing joint. You've actually connected the patient to a medical home or, or the healthcare system for the first time and actually dealt with the whole context and saw that as part of your task and not simply as saying, can I operate or can I not, based on, on the patient's condition. That, that's an exciting change oh, that, that I think uh, we're gonna see more of. It is, I mean, you can look at the um, expansion of a lot of orthopedic surgeons looking at business degrees, and, but I've looked more in the idea of what the business of medicine in a sense of managing healthcare delivery. And I think managing orthopedic surgical delivery is what the message that I'm trying to get across. You're not just managing the arthritic disease, and you're not managing arthritis, and you're not just managing their pain. We have to take a role in managing musculoskeletal delivery in complicated systems, whether it's Mumbai, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's the South Bronx, there's a world that the process of delivering the care, there's a science behind this, and there's a business science behind this that, that will lead to just exponential value for populations and generations to come. It is great, still is, I still do close to 300 operations a year. I do a hip replacement, that individual patient does well. Right? On the other hand, it's also even more satisfying that when we went to the Bronx, we took over a hospital orthopedic delivery system, which didn't exist, that saw about 3,500 visits in this community. Now we're up to 40,000. So 237 operations, now up to over 2,000. So we are, and we're, we are still understanding the complexities of delivering comprehensive musculoskeletal care to a unique and diverse cultural community. So managing healthcare delivery is more important than just managing disease. You need to do both. And that's the play I'm making here right now, that this ambulatory surgery focus 
is another is actually a, an example of a healthcare delivery, because we're delivering a mini healthcare system here. It, we're, control, we're taking arthritic disease, but we're taking it through this whole thing and trying to deliver this patient back to the community. Less pain, safer, less risk of infection. It's all this theoretic right now, but I think it's going to be very exciting when we combine the craftsmanship, which is down at ground level, and managing healthcare delivery, which is at 30,000 feet. How do you think that the current payment structures are either hindering this or, given the transition we're seeing, going to promote this? Because, you know, today I think you would see a lot of orthopedic surgeons who would say, there's no way I can provide this care. I get paid for doing this operation. There's not enough margin in that payment, and nobody's willing to pay for me to have a social worker, for example, that manages the patient coming in, getting what they need, going out in the transition of care. What do you think the system needs to do in order to make this financially viable? I think a surgeon who is getting paid to do the joint replacement is not in position to manage this continuum of care. It's not only too expensive, they don't have the expertise and they're not going to get the back education. I think the payment structure that's most exciting, which is not new, but it's new to most people, would be ACOs or some type of global payment, global billing. And we talked about global billing over 25 years ago, uh, bundled payments, bundled billing, however you talk about it. So what happens is if you do you know, 500 joint replacements a year and someone calculates a 90-day, 30 days before, 90 days afterwards, that's 120 days, and says we will give you it has previously has cost us $48,000. We'd like this done for $35,000. You begin to aggregate, aggregate a lot of 500 patients at $35,000. You begin to see where the profit margin is. Because the current payment structure is such a disparity. Hospitals could make as much as $17,000 or $45,000 for a joint replacement. Surgeon makes $1,200 to $1,800. And no one even knows where the costs are going. Most costs are charges and not really costs. So when you begin to get bundled payment systems, then, then the payer has fixed their cost. So right off the bat, even if the payer is the government, they're not continually get fee for service. And I think defined uh, procedures such as joint employment are classic for 120 day bundled payment global billing, where you take complete risk uh, and for anything that happens in that time period. You essentially become a mini insurance company. And then hospital networks or groups of doctors, a 60-person doctor group will have enough volume to share the risk. But I think the, the most exciting part that's happening now is the ACOs, accountability care organizations, are exciting if they actually get off the ground, begin to take risk dollars, and the physicians the advantage is the physicians will have a voice. Currently, physicians do not have a voice in insurance companies. They just don't have a voice. If the insurance company denies payment for an extra physical therapy or for a drug or for a, a certain type of modality, no physician, you could go peer to peer relate, but there's no voice. Even if you joined a large hospital network that had bureaucracy and took the insurance dollars, Physicians have a voice at hospital networks. And I think that's the biggest change that I, I hope to see, that the dollars, the decision-making of, of health care gets out of the insurance companies and back to either hospitals, doctor networks, or some environment where doctors have a voice. Because it's, it's the fact that insurance companies aren't really managed care, they're managed risk companies. And doctor groups need to manage care. And I have no problems with insurance companies existing as risk managers, but I do see this ambulatory surgery as a great opportunity to get, let's just say, you know, $28,000 for the whole continuum of care. You're doing 100 cases a year. Now you have money for the social worker. Now you're doing outcomes using some tools to prove your value. So. I think bundled payment uh, is going to be the, at least a short-term answer to making it financially viable to do this. 
Do you think this dynamic will drive more orthopedic surgeons to be employed in larger organizations that really have the, the tools to manage the whole continuum? Do you think they're going to be independent contractors and just contract for their specific aspect and sort of abdicate the responsibility for all the, the transition of care, the management of the perioperative period, all the things we've talked about that need to be done to make this effective? Which, which way do you think this is going to go? Well, you know, we, we, of course, there's always been predictions in this country that something's going to go all way, one way or another. Um, you know, we still, except for VHS tapes, most media is even still around, you know, not everything has gone digital. But I do think that, well, there was a great article in Medscape recently about uh, the increase in employed physicians, you know, going up. It wasn't specific to orthopedics, though. I think we're going to see a statistical increase in the number of employed surgeons. And that number will shift the power structure, I think, at most hospitals. Because as internists have gotten out of hospitals and abdicated to hospitalists who are on shift work, it's really the surgeons who are the last people sticking around. And I think more and more surgeons will be employed by the hospital. Now, employment does not mean, you know, you're a worker on the railways in 1890. I mean, there are employees who work for Microsoft and work for Oracle who have great jobs, great power, and great influence in the company. Um, and I think that um, when surgeons become employed, take leadership roles in hospitals, it'll be a bit of a game changer, and it'll bring back a little bit of the era of, of what I have called the voice. So I think the I would predict certainly in the next three years you're going to see significant growth of employed physicians um, because physicians do not have the tools to hire all the finance people. Um, I think that will, will not be perceived as evil. Um, there will be some environments, some scenarios where the contractor model will be better if for certain hospitals. Um, but I think in the end, um, the employment model will be the plurality, at least. It may not be the majority, but it'll certainly be the plurality. Do you see that that's what's happening in the South Bronx? I mean, dealing, dealing with this situation in your environment, is it leaning towards more and more employment and more consensus amongst the employed physicians that they're all part of this team and sort of shoulder that responsibility and, and abdicate not their decision making and not their influence, but don't try to manage it all. Yep, it's interesting you mentioned, so I'll give you the, tr the real life example. Uh, 14 years ago, the Department of Orthopedics in our hospital was a contracted service. So a certain amount of dollars went to an outside group to manage orthopedics there. And even in their heyday, they never went over 400 operations a year, all right? And the hospital made a decision to bring an employed group. And we have a very corporate model. I mean, I have did some time in executive education and business schools. And, and we run with a leadership and a tiered model. And we now, just to give you an idea, for just about 30% increased cost to the hospital based on the contracted rate, we're actually delivering close to seven or eight times gross revenue. And so there is a value. And I'll compare ourselves to other hospitals in South Bronx. One's a city hospital that has a, a, a city of New York hospital that has a contracted group. And one is a voluntary, uh, not-for-profit, private hospital like ours that has a contracted group. No question, both are very high-quality surgery. But their volume of surgery is extremely low. And their clinic volume is very low. So there's a question of whether a contracted group connects with the mission of the hospital. And I think what we're beginning to understand is corporations that do well have missions. And if you're a contracted group, you know, like a, like a, like a U.S. Armed Services contracting group may not have the same mission as a full-time Marine. In the same sense, I think certain hospitals just are going to have to bring the surgeon back in to the mission of the hospital. And I think that's the biggest advantage of an employed model. But they cannot be employed without a leadership structure that is, in my opinion, 
run, orthopedic surgeons run by orthopedic surgeons. I don't think orthopedic surgeons could be part of the general surgery department. I think, I think they can't be part of answering to a primary care physician. They have to have a leadership structure. Now, we answer to a lot of people. There's a physician in chief at a hospital who is in charge of all the chairmen. He's an internist, and he is, he is my boss. But I do not answer, but I do have my own budget, and we make our own decisions. So I think orthopedic surgeons are going to need to understand that they, we have a unique position. Half of our practices are primary care. We do a lot of definitive treatment in the outpatient setting. We do definitive treatment in the operating room. And so we're not really like the general surgeons. So I think the future will find us in a very good position. And I think orthopedic departments should include internist, primary care, musculoskeletal people, should include podiatrists answering to the orthopedic chair should include rehab physiatry within orthopedics, because all that is musculoskeletal delivery. Well, I think that's a fascinating model, and I, I, I tend to agree with your whole statement about the mission. I think that uh, we've seen over the last probably 30, 40 years, the, the trend towards viewing healthcare really as purely an economic gain. It's, it's simply, uh, I have this skill, uh, what's my return on investment and how do I maximize that? And, and the notion of mission, with, with the exception, I'm not suggesting that, that all orthopedic surgeons are just economic animals, but we've definitely seen that move towards, towards that balance from the mission of what, what I'm really obligated to do as a physician of any sort into the point to where uh, uh, we're more economic actors. And that's happened for lots of reasons. What you're talking about, I think, is a shift back towards the notion that the physician is a member of a team that has certain obligations or mission uh, to, the, to the greater good, which is gonna require us to negotiate. You know, as you right. pointed out, um, you answer to an internist, but there's lots of other folks that are negotiating for their budgets right. based on, on real constraints within the healthcare system. Absolutely right. I think that the key word we're using in environment now, sustainability. We're realizing if we're going to protect the orthopedic profession for more than a half a generation, then we need a system that is sustainable, economically sustainable. Um, we don't want orthopedic surgeons not to become orthopedic surgeons in urban areas. We don't want not to be orthopedic surgeons in rural areas. We don't want everyone to go to the suburbs of Raleigh Durham. We, we all, I interviewed a kid about five years ago who said his, well, I said, what were your goals? He says, my goal was to own an ambulatory surgery center um, and develop uh, um, a uh, device for shoulders. I said, that's not really a goal. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking like, what were your professional goals? You know, what do you, I want to only do shoulder. I said, it's still, it's not like a professional goal. So I think, that you can have financially viable, sustainable systems. Um, the payment structure can be quite good. Um, the key is really understanding that you're part of a team. Now the team issue, a lot of people give lift service to. And I like to think of a team in medicine of like baseball not a team like basketball, and they're very different. The team in baseball is when the ball comes to Derek Jeter at shortstop, it doesn't matter how many other people are on the team. He's got to field the ball and throw it to Mark Tixera on first base, all right? And it's the same sense. You know, every team has a number of people. I'll take the Yankees because they're two train stops south of me, okay? Derek Jeter makes quite a lot of money, so does other people, but there are people who make less money, but they're critical parts of the team. And Jeter understands those people as part of the team. And so a team doesn't necessarily mean everyone is equal. It means everyone is important. And without the ninth player, you can't even play the game. So I, I want to caution against people who are afraid of the concept of a team, thinking that it will devalue everybody. It's not a socialist concept. It's a concept that everything you do is part of an ecosystem, that someone's going to make you better. 
And I think the orthopedic delivery system is a great team approach in that way, in my opinion. You know, you're, you're doing a critical part, but the moment the patient's in the ICU, that ICU doctor, you don't even count. You're, you're not even, you're like, you're like Derek Jeter in the dugout when somebody else is up. Everyone's gonna come up at a different time, but you gotta build the team right. You gotta build the team well, sustainable, and of course, it has to make money. It has to make money. How much? It has to make as much money to put food on people's tables, to get the right kind of medicines for the patients, to get the right kind of services for the patient. No, you know, line I use is an old Tolstoy, old, old Tolstoy, everything with Tolstoy is old. There's a line from Tolstoy, Anna Karenina. All happy families are happy in the same way. Unhappy families are unhappy all differently. All successful medical delivery systems are successful the same way. All unsuccessful ones screw up in their own unique ways, okay? And we should take lessons from the successful medical delivery systems around the world. Patient-centric, understand the bottom line, understand what works and doesn't work, properly compensate people for good work and good time, and make a system that'll go for more than one generation. Well, I applaud your, your, your vision for this, and, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping that someday we'll see bone home or orthopedic home or whatever this concept is going to be called. Um, so I, I'm 100% behind this, and I, I wish you luck as you, as you take these concepts uh, forward. But I do think that it, it takes a different view of, of outpatient total joint replacement. I mean, it's obviously strayed far away from that, but using that as the, as the, as the night of starting this discussion to sort of highlight what the real problems are, I, I think it's a fascinating discussion. So I want to thank you today for, for joining us and presenting this idea and uh, wish you luck in the future as you uh, uh, obviously have uh, put, your, put your efforts where your mouth is. You're actually living this and uh, I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.